Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Stenton for the back to front, upstairs, downstairs tour with a lot of behind the scenes spaces that are hardly ever on view and some that haven't been on view for decades. So we're really focusing on spaces where um, servants slept and dressed and some of the places that they worked at Stenton not related to food. Next week, we'll be doing the food access tour time almost same exact place, Facebook Live, um, to look at that aspect of Stenton, life at Stenton. So we're panning actually to look at some of the outbuildings here as a starting point. I'm standing in the middle of our sort of service yard behind the house. And you may have noticed that the window arrangement on the back of the house is not symmetrical like the front. And so it's a very much more um, an arrangement so that it works well, it accommodates the staircase, and the roof of the piazza, this porch across the back, was added by um, the second generation in the 1750s. So you see that this roof is just cutting across the house in a way that actually detracts a bit um, from the windows on the staircase when you're on the inside, but it's quite practical. I should just remind everyone that Stenton was completed in 1730 um, and some of the buildings that we're going to look at today have were built at various points in time. Just like you want to renovate the kitchen or the bathroom at your house um, and those spaces are frequently turned over, the same was true in the 18th century that people wanted to upgrade those technologies and their food preparation spaces. So next week we'll talk more about how the original kitchen and wash house were on this side. And they're about the same size as the extant kitchen and wash house, which may, um, this kitchen part may be a little, an early building, but the brick facade that you see dates to the 1780s um, with living quarters for servants uh, above. The other outbuildings that are out here are the green, built in 1811 by the third generation to live here, George and Deborah Logan. The first generation carriage house, which is largely going to be obscured today by this um, Magnolia Grandiflora, but this would have been a gable-roofed structure originally. And for those of you who maybe come to Stenton for our programs, um, that's often our program space. So we're going to head inside now into the laundry. This laundry space is our staff um, and everyday kitchen today, but you can see some of the remnants of the um, required equipment related to doing laundry. There is a hearth that was um, made smaller as a place where you could kind of do some cooking. There's a crane in this fireplace, the piece of iron that swings with the pots. Um, but this set kettle was added here. This masonry um, bit here with a built-in kettle for heating large volumes of hot water that would be fed from a fire below and a bake oven that we'll look at next week. But we're going to go upstairs and see where the workers slept. Um, it's hard to say that they lived there because it's suggestive that they tended to live through their work and these were really places to um, fundamentally sleep, dress, maybe socialize a little bit. But there are two large rooms up here under the sloping roofs, in this case with um, beaded board construction for the knee walls. And this space also has a very interesting feature we're looking forward to understanding a little bit better, but we're just here with the hearth that was below. There's a smoking closet here with a brick paved floor. And there's, um, I'm hoping that the light allows you to see a little bit. This space has been a caretaker's residence, I think for just about as long as Stenton's been a museum throughout the 20th century um, and until very recently. And then our plans are for these spaces to become staff offices. So there's an, some 20th century walls up here that made it possible to have a kitchen and a bathroom. But when we go over to the house attic, you'll see 
um, cupboards in the knee walls, and it seems that this space um, had these as well, but they've been filled in. And originally, too, there was a staircase in the far corner of this room, so that each room had its own staircase, this one to the kitchen and the one we came up, the laundry staircase. And the staircase really does show its age. This isn't the only winder staircase that we'll traverse today. And we're going to head over to the house across the piazza here. And um, our historic structures report really seems to suggest that it was um, George and Deborah Logan, the third generation, who relocated the kitchen to, um, to this side of the mansion. Um, but the fact that the porch went on the 1750s is part of why we think that um, it really may be, in fact, William Logan who relocated the kitchen. I do want to take just a brief moment to show you these um, turned knobs here where perhaps servants were hanging things like buckets or um, stools, clothes, hats. We're going to look at some um, that seem to be, if not exactly the same, quite similar in the attic. And originally, all three doors at the back would have allowed this easy flow of service from the yard at both sides of the house back to front through the um, service corridors at the sides. At the moment, the only, only the central door is operable. And we're going to walk through the back dining room, which we'll talk about more next week, um, so you can see the service there. And I mentioned to you that this door would have operated so that there was this direct flow. And during William Logan's generation, in fact, if you can, I don't know if you can quite capture this, there was a partition wall here. So this room was quite cut off from a light standpoint by the porch going on the back. And there was this corridor that didn't last um, through the generations that created a kind of service walkway here. In the side passage on this side of the house is the service staircase itself. And that originally also went to the cellar, which was closed off in 1900. So there was this complete vertical um, axis through the house for servants and maybe some maybe children also to get things from the top to the bottom and to serve the rooms on the ground and second floors. So inside this little cupboard, we suspect this may have been almost like a, a landing way station in effect for things going up and down, particularly things like um, chamber pots that might be pulled down, emptied, cleaned, set here so that someone can grab them on the way up. And the same with things like chamber sticks that would be used in the bedrooms, cleaned every day, reset with a, a stub of a candle and could be taken up in the night as someone was going by. And you get a sense here too, that on this side of the house, and this is the other side doesn't function this way, the, um, the door to the, to the front room almost functions like a folding screen, again, making it all the more discreet for service to kind of happen so that there's this performance of service from the back to the front. And so I'm going to climb the service stair, which if you're not used to it, imagine me carrying um, chamber pots and trays of food or tea, um, is a bit treacherous. This tight winder, it doesn't have any railing. And as you come up this landing, um, this service passage functions as an in-between for the nursery where children would have slept. And we haven't been entirely clear whether there was an age limit to how many children were in the nursery. But on the early inventories, there's a bed and there's also a, 
a trundle bed, a truckle bed as they called them at the time, that would have been in this space. And so this service access to this space is key for servants who would be looking after the Logan children of all the generations to live here. So I'm going to head up again, grabbing the two-dimensional sort of knob. And as we come up the stair, the camera I think is going to be showing you there's some half timbering type construction where there are um, kind of posts and rails filled in with plaster above some of these doors in the passages and then the um, joinery is all pegged. Above the camera is the main beam through the center of the house exposed and the partition walls up here are um, beaded edge wide boards, pine boards that were still available in Pennsylvania in the 1720s and 30s. And once we get up into the garret spaces, on this service side, things are entirely unpainted. So there's just dark oxidized pine board walls with um, oak framing for the, for the um, openings. So interesting things about this, the way this space is arranged, this was a storage room. It did not have a window. And um, there was originally a little vent in the roof and it could be locked from the outside so that goods could be stored there that perhaps James Logan or William Logan were hoping um, to truly keep from the enslaved and indentured workers who were sleeping up here, living up here. And as we turn back and look against the, um, the wall, I mentioned over in the wing when we were above the kitchen and wash house, there were those filled in areas. Up here, there are these knee wall accesses to the underside of the roof, kind of throughout the rooms up here in the, in the attic. This next room probably was also a room where servants slept. It's not especially large, but it has a dormer window. Um, it had no heat. There's no fireplace in here. And this is where Logan family objects that we keep in perpetuity, but that are um, not of the generations that we're interpreting at the moment have, have stayed. This next larger kind of east garret um, also unheated, had two windows as a corner room, and it has an, a closet that um, a comp has shelving for storage of, of things or clothes that might be folded with an interesting kind of dimensional balustered vent at the top. And you're also getting a look at the um, hardware that's never been painted, all of which came from Bristol, England, when Logan, James Logan was building the house. Um, this is packing material on display. So one of the other features of the attic that would have been important, and here's where the turned knobs are, is inside this cupboard in the hallway that would have allowed servants to keep uh, kind of the clothes communally. And the knobs do not seem to all be of exactly the same generation, but the turnings on some of them seem to be We'll have to do some more comparisons, but um, nearly identical to the ones on the back of the house. And we're still in the unpainted side of the attic, but heading into the middle room, which at the moment is displaying our exhibit about Dinah, uh, a woman who came to live here at Stenton with, um, as the kind of dowry property of William Logan's wife, Hannah Emlyn. So when they took on Stenton in the 1750s. Earlier in the 1730s, it's quite likely that most of the particularly enslaved people who were working here were not related to each other, that they came um, as a, a parcel, which we talked about last week in our program. Um, but they may have been sleeping in this unheated room with the single window. Um, probably there were pallets beds, just mattresses on the floor in the corners, kind of under, um, under the roof would make it 
easy. But there was, in this room, there was no other furniture until the second generation. You may be able to make out the sort of ghosts of shelving on the wall. And um, one of the James Logan Library bookcases, which you might have seen on our first Facebook Live tour in the Blue Lodging Room, um, was here for many years. And so where it stood against the wall has left spaces that did not completely oxidize to the full darkness of the rest of the wall. And the bookshelf has a hook here that's identical to these three hooks. And you can imagine maybe um, workers leaving their hats here or clothes here as they're going in and out of this room. And I also don't know if you can capture at all, but this is um, some of our Stenton graffiti. William Logan Jr. sailed for England October 7th, 1760. Um, that is William Logan and Hannah Emlyn Logan's son. And then there's also a couple little spots here where S.R. Johnson, caretaker, um, left his marks in 1916. And so it may even be that these rooms were still also being used to some degree for um, caretakers in the 20th century, once Stenton was a museum. So now we're on the painted side of the attic here. And you're seeing um, ochre paint that was applied in the 1980s. And that there's a real distinct division between the unpainted side related to the service stair, the sort of lower end of the attic, and the painted side relating to the big staircase. And it's not entirely clear if this is a replica based on evidence, but the restoration architect um, G. Edwin Brumbaugh probably had this latch made of wood in the 1950s. It, it's quite crisp looking. And so whether or not it was designed this way, um, we're not sure. But we think it's quite likely that enslaved workers were largely sleeping on the service stair side of the attic and indentured um, servants were sleeping in this painted side of the attic, with the curiosity being that the middle room connects to both sides. And so that may also have something to do with servants being called to access the second floor and wait on people in the night and being able to use both staircases to avoid going into rooms. But these painted rooms, um, particularly this is the largest one, are rather commodious. They had the same um, servant beds in some cases, but this, this largest one, which is now our archive, had um, a bedstead, a table, and a chair. So there's a little space for a little bit of living and some privacy for the person or persons who slept here. And um, it's heated, the whole room is whitewashed. And we've wondered if um, Peter Schenkmeyer, who's a man Logan refers to in his 1720s ledger as my servant, maybe a butler type of person was in fact sleeping in this particular space. And then the slightly smaller, but also completely painted and heated space, um, now used as an office, but you can kind of glimpse in there, was um, maybe the housekeeper space. We know the housekeeper's name was Phoebe Dickinson. So we're going to head down the main staircase. And we're showing you, as you come down, that the balusters, the sort of classically shaped turned balusters that form the support for the handrail for the staircase, um, don't continue all the way to the top. So where they weren't seen, is finished in a much more utilitarian way, like um, somewhat like, although I think it's a 20th century one, the rail you saw over in the rooms above the kitchen and wash house. And then also in contrast where the builders did care, um, because the house was sort of planned outside and inside somewhat um, incongruously, this um, paneled wainscot literally runs right across the window and in fact sort of blocks it and considering how expensive glass was um, it's just a kind of curious feature of the house but it allows for 
the fullness of the window to be seen on the outside. And in this space, next to the nursery, was it was actually called on the inventories, the adjoining room. But we think probably um, this was a space for what the Logans would have called in the 18th century nurses, governesses, um, who looked after the children and slept here. And so this is a hypothesis, but I mentioned Dinah upstairs. And um, she stayed on working for the family after she was freed in 1776. She was paid wages and worked not only for um, William Logan's generation, but then stayed and worked for um, George and Deborah Logan's generation and may have slept in this room. The evidence seems to be that she truly helped raise the third um, generation's children here at Stenton. So I don't know if there are any questions coming in, but here you can see the roof of the piazza porch coming across the house. And I think we're going to leave you all here and hope that you'll join us again next week for our food access tour at 1230 Eastern Daylight Time next Wednesday. Thank you all.